Okay, I guess I will. Hi, this is John Van from Neurosurgical TV. We're having a webcast at Simplifying Atlanto Axial Fixation Innovation with Sushil Pactar. Okay, Dr. Pactar, it's all yours. Good, good, good afternoon. Can you see my presentation? Is my presentation on? Yes, it is. You guys can see my slide? Yes. Do you want to make it larger? Okay, so there you go. Perfect. Perfect. That's right. Thank you very much. At the beginning, let me thank my dear friend, Hype, who has begun with a bang in color, and I'm sure he's got miles to go and miles to go to change neurosurgery and the type of neurosurgery that is being done around here. And I thank Hype for this opportunity. So I'm going to just share a little bit of my work on Atlanta actual fixation. I have no disclosures. The only disclosure is my mentor, teacher, and guide, Professor Ramani, from whom I learned spinal surgery. So I look at Atlanta actually joined somewhat like a maze, and we have to find a solution which is straight to the maze. If you look at C1, C2, the predominant movement in C1, C2 is rotation, and any operation which fixes the rotation will fix the Atlanta actual joint and treat the instability. Megan's technique described in 1986 did good justice to it. Unfortunately, the anatomy of the vertebral artery prevented this operation being performed in almost 30 to 40% of the cases. So in spite of being, in, being an excellent operation, it fell out of popularity till this anatomy was discovered where they found that the vertebral artery can be very high riding and there can be very little place to pass the screw across the joint without injuring the vertebral artery. It was Dr. Goyal in 1994 and then Hams in 2001 who, who changed this concept where you could pass screws into the pedicle or the pars of C2. And then of course, a lot of people tried to give credit to Dr. Goyal I took up the harms when actually it was Goyle's technique, but I'm happy that of late all this has changed and people call it the Dr. Goyle's technique. Then when I studied the pedicle and pars of the C2, I found that the course of the vertebral artery can be very variable. And that in spite of any technique, there always remained a chance of vertebral artery injury. Necessity is the mother of invention. Research is search again. And if you look at the CT scan, there is always dense bone under the facet of C2. And the fallacy of the CT scan is till you do the CT scan in correct coronal planes, you cannot identify this bone. There is always dense bone under the facet, free of the vertebral artery. And if you pass the screw just under the facet joint, the entire discussion about vertebral artery and injury to the vertebral artery becomes redundant. There is no need of uh, the talk of, you know, vertebral artery injury or navigation, et cetera, if you use this new trajectory just under the facet joint. Instead of passing the screw from the pars or the pedicle, you pass the screw right underneath and let the screw go downwards into the vertebral body. So now this is an example. You can study this, that there is always bone under the a, a facet of C2. This is another example and see how the screw is passed. And these screws, my dear friends, are divergent screws. They go down to the body. And if you go back to physics, you'll find, see this, it need not be that the screw heads have to be parallel to each other. The C2 screw can be above and the C1 screw. The idea is that the screw should be, you know, holding the, word, the joints together and give you good space for putting bone graft. And you can see this, even in a very high riding vertebral artery, still this technique can be done without any fear of injuring the vertebral artery. These are divergent screws, and a divergent screw construct is biomechanically superior to parallel screws described by Goel and uh, Harms. And then this technique got published way back in 2016 as a new entry point for the C2 screw in posterior C1, C2 fixation, significantly reducing the possibility of vertebral artery injury. Then British General Neurosurgery, then Global Spine Journal, et cetera, 
but then I was not still happy. VSP plate screw construct is stronger than a polyaxial screw rod construct. Actually, polyaxial screw rods came in lumbar spine because the plates could not be bent sidewards. And therefore, people came out with polyaxial screws. In C1, C2, there is no such problem. And therefore, we must resort to using the VSP plate. The VSP plate gives you better opportunities to fix, reduce, manipulate the C1, C2 joint, like this example. Can you see this? If you pass the screw and use a VSP plate, there are multiple holes in the VSP plate where you can adjust. This was, of course, published as a American Association of Neurological Surgeons poster. And this was the concept that you could have multiple opportunities to adjust the screw in the C1, C2 joint. And these are some examples where you can see you can bring posterior compression, distraction of the joint. And uh, then I went on to modify the screws. And this was the final construct. And uh, you can see this, this concept is very simple that you pass a steffy kind of screw. These were made for me by Jeon. Put the spacer and you can pull the joint, the C1 backwards and manipulate the C1, C2 joint in the VSP plate, reduce it, compress it. And the, the VSP plate is definitely more, in polyaxial screw construct, you'll have to loosen and the moment you loosen the top knot, the implant becomes unstable. So uh, this got again published in Journal of Neurosurgery um, uh, in the June 2020 issue. I will, I will send this, show this video later if you have time. But this was the technique which was published in JNS, uh, the video journal section in June 2020 as a cover page article in the uh, July 2020 issue. Then, of course, still I was not happy and restless because of the paravertebral venous plexus and the vertebral artery, the necessity to divide the C2 root. And these were all cantilever constructs from behind, trying to manipulate the body in the front and the line of weight transmission was in the front. If you see the recent literature in lumbar spine, there is a slow but definite shift towards understanding fixation in lumbar spine and A-lift procedures like X-lift, O-lift, these are becoming more popular than P-lift and T-lift. And people are now shifting anteriorly because the most important thing is to use a wedge-shaped cage which can recorrect and recreate the lordosis of the lumbar spine. The same concept, if you study in the C1, C2 joint, the weight gets transmitted from the occipital condyles to the atlas and then onto the C2 facet very little weight goes on to the posterior aspect. So the essential fixation must be here. If the patient in extension has got the angle of mandible above the C2 through disc, then these patients have to be operated from the front. And this is possible in more than 95% of the cases. And you would realize that this operation is just nothing else but an anterior cervical fusion where you don't disrupt, disrupt any muscles except the anterior attachment of longus coli. Unlike the posterior surgery where you are disrupting the entire posterior tension band, there is a lot of bone stock where you can pass the screw. There is a lot of space to, to garden the joints and put adequate bone grafts or cages without any fear of injuring the vertebral artery, without destroying the posterior tension band. These are the direction of the screws you can see, starting under the facet and going upwards and outwards, and in the lateral going towards the posterior aspect of the, this, and you get ad adequate hold as good as the megal screw. And mind you, any screw which crosses the joint is superior to a cantilever construct. When you want to fuse a joint, you have to have the screw across the joint. This is basic principle of orthopedics. So this is the screw trajectory. There are various options like using plates and you know screws, and you don't require a lot of instruments, just a proper micro drill and a C arm, and you can see the correct direction of the screw, how it goes across. You don't require too many instruments, just a few set of right angle retractors, a good micro drill, and a set of screws. And that's about it. Nowadays, you know, you see Medtronic comes with big instrument boxes with so many instruments inside for doing and they also have one instrument to open the box and one instrument to close the box. You don't require those kind of gadgets. So these are some examples of Atlanta actual dislocation series. And you can see just by passing the screw and putting bone grafts in the joint, you can get the correction. 
This is another example of Atlanta actual long standing Atlanta actual dislocation treated by passing anterior trans articular screws. Then I went on to put plates and cages. And you can see, you can put a large tricorticate. The essence of the operation in C1, C2 is reduction and fixation. Recreation of, you have to create instability to treat deformity. You want to treat deformity, first create instability. Then get put bone graft inside the joint. The principle of fusion is there should be bleeding bone across the joint from both the joint surfaces and then put the bone graft. This is the main operation. The implant is a secondary aspect of the operation. Unfortunately, people focus on the implant and they think that the implant is the operation. The implant just increases the fusion rate and allows early mobilization. But getting bone grafts properly, seeing that there is good gardening of the joints, that is the aim of the operation. So these are some examples. I will not spend time, long-term results showing fusion across the joints with uh, anterior plate screws. And you can see that this operation is done through a muscle planes like anterior cervical spinal surgery, just disrupting a little bit of the longer scoli. Most of the neck joint movements are preserved. You can see that some restriction of rotation because the C1, C2 joint is weak, but flexion extension, there's no problem. The posterior tension band is intact. All you need is a set of screws. And this is the long-term result as to show that the joint is fused. This is the end point of the operation. This is how the operation should ultimately look like when you do a, the CT scan or MRI six months to nine months down the line. And if you're not getting this, then the operation is incomplete and the whole process was futile. Of course, you get complications. Anybody who says that doesn't have complications, either lying or has not operated enough. So this you see that sometimes, you know, you, you become overconfident, don't use the CM, and you can end up a screw in the wrong direction. This was a patient, again, where I had a suboptimal reduction and the screws were passed, I had to remove this and redo this. Sometimes you get a little weakness of the hypoglossal nerve and the marginal mandibular nerve, but of late this has reduced because initially I used to dissect the hypoglossal nerve. I've stopped looking for it like the recurrent laryngeal nerve in thyroid surgery. If you don't search for the nerve, there'll be no deficit. Start a little below at the C2 disc and dissect upwards, you will not get a problem. So these are some implant failures. You can see this, this was osteoporotic bone and I had an implant failure in this. I was not use locking plates initially. Of course, that is all changed. These are my earlier slides. And then in one patient, I did not drill into the C1 lateral mass properly, passed the screw overconfidently, came out of the operation and when the patient woke up, she woke up with the torticollis. I had to redo this case, remove the screw again, pass, a, see that I drill because you remember, that atlas is not cancerous bone, atlas is dense particle bone. And sometimes if you're not drilled well into the atlas, you might uh, just end up with this kind of situation. You know? So there are many complications, you can't hide from them. Of course there are complications, but nothing as serious as when you do posterior surgery. So again, my results were published at various places. This was the first time in Japanese spinal surgery I published the, the procedure of, of fixing the anterior C1, C2 joints with plates. Before that, there is no description in English literature about anterior plate screw fixation of the atlantic axial joints. Then subsequently in Journal of Spinal Surgery from India. Now these are cases, very unusual cases. For example, this case of lateral mass tuberculosis, this kind of patient would have ended up in a posterior occiput C1, C2 fixation. This can be easily done by unilateral fixation using a plate screw as well as a transarticular screw. And uh, you do away with doing an occipital cervical fixation. So craniovertebral tuberculosis is a very good application. And then this is odontoid fractures. Most of us know that type 2 odontoid fractures need to be fixed. But there are many odontoid fractures which do not read and do not fit into the classification. For example, fractures which are running through the facet joint, fractures which are displaced, fractures which are impacted. See, this is an example of an impacted fracture. This is this, this just, you just have, don't call it type two. This requires reduction and fixation. Odontoid screw, I think, is a very, very simple operation only in elderly patients, not for as a universal application for all patients because the odontoid changes with time. Even in elderly patients, there's a very high failure rate because the odontoid becomes osteoporotic. So displaced impacted fractures, comminuted fractures, osteoporotic fractures, Odontoid fractures with associated C2, C1 fractures, there has to be new thinking. 
horizontal odontoid fractures. I will show you some very excellent examples. There are a lot of important technical points in an anterior odontoid screw. Number one, the screw must go beyond the distal cortex. The screw must sink into the proximal cortex. There should be adequate bone in front of the screw. And you put your hand on your heart and you see that once odontoid, most of the odontoid screws are done without following these principles. This is an example, you know, the odontoid screw has to be perpendicular. If it is not perpendicular, it is going to displace the fracture rather than fix the fracture. And fractures don't read textbooks. You don't get fractures with your horizontal. Now look at this example. Somebody has done an odontoid fracture. Neither has it gone beyond the distal cortex. Neither the proximal head has been sunk inside. And this is the end result that the screw starts coming out. Like I said, the odontoid fracture, the odontoid bone consistency varies with age. So just an odontoid screw, which is the most popular operation, is, is not an operation which can be done in all cases. In younger patients, odontoid is dense bone, and if odontoid is fractured, 100% it is associated with injury to the ligamentous complex and is a highly unstable injury. And just doing an odontoid screw, I think, is a very wrong concept. So this was a displaced odontoid fracture. This patient would have been ended up in a transoral odontoid excision and C1, C2 fixation. So this patient was operated by my technique where we reduce the fracture, pass transarticular screws and get it back in alignment. You can see how the atlas has gone behind it has reduced and come back to position. This is another patient where the fracture is running into the facet joint. So type two fracture running into the facet joint is an unstable fracture. Here I use a VSP plate with screws. The advantage of the VSP plate is that the basic principle of fracture fixation can be followed, that is compression fixation, compression fixation. And you'll see the long-term result. Now, this is a kind of anteriorly displaced fracture where I impale the fracture with a tab, bring it back in position, then use a plate screw fixation to fix the anterior arch of the distal fragment, the proximal fragment, and all under in compression mode. This is the technique, and the long-term result has to show that the odontoid has been, you know, the cortex has been reformed and uh, the bone has fused. That should be the end point of the treatment. And if this is not done, then this operation is you know, useless. This is another example where you see this uh, odontoid fracture, which is you know, almost inclined posteriorly with combination of the C2 bone. And this kind of fracture, when you put an extension, is going to worsen further. So this patient is not going to be, you can't pass the odontoid screw in the perfect position. So you do a VSP plate and over a period of time, you see that the, the fracture has healed. Formation of bone across the fracture is, should be the end point of the treatment. Nothing, anything short of that is incomplete. Now this is again a fracture, displaced fracture of the odontoid process, which is an unstable situation because there's a fracture plus displacement means the, the ligament is disrupted. So the patient is fixed to the VSP plate and anterior transarticular screw. This was the construct which uh, was described by me, that you can treat both the fracture and the instability from the front without disrupting the posterior tension band. So this was the construct where you have VSP plate in the front, do compression fixation of the fracture, and pass bilateral transarticular screws. So it, it, is a, it is a treatment which can be applied for any fracture. For example, an anteriorly inclined fracture. This, this fracture cannot be treated. This is the VSP concept where you pass the screw very close to the edge. As you tighten, it will compress. This is a basic principle of orthopedics. So type 2 anterior slanting fracture would have ended up in posterior C1, C2 fixation. But if you do the anterior VSP plate, you can treat this fracture without doing a C1, C2 fixation without doing a C1, C2 fixation. Now, this is a displaced, impacted fracture. You put the patient in traction, it doesn't reduce, explore the place, pass a tab, reduce the fracture, pass a plate, and then fix this, and then pass anterior transarticular to So you treat the fracture and the atlanto action instability all at the same sitting, only by one approach, no need of doing posterior surgery. So this is another example, locked C1, C2 facet. Very, very unusual injury, very difficult to treat. Traction doesn't reduce them. There's deformity open, the fracture side. Create instability by cutting the longer scoli muscle. Create instability. Once you create instability, impale the distal odontoid, bring it back into position and pass. So to treat deformity, 
the juniors must understand you must be ready to create additional instability so you can see the long term result now this is another example unclassified odontoid fracture vertical odontoid fracture with parse fracture on one side in extension also it remains you know unreduced these are the kind of nasty fractures with a parse fracture and a fracture of the odontoid not described in standard classification so what you do is a new treatment which was described by me passing a transarticular screw because of the facet fracture passing a plate screw and you and treating the disc with the anti replant this is the long term result you can see flexion extent fusion and the fracture having been you know, remodeled and fused all through a small incision through the muscles without disrupting the posterior tension and i call it direct compression reduction fixation again published in neurological research in 19 2017 subsequently in uh, neurosurgery and with no cm no navigation no injury of the vertebral arch then the next thing that attracted my attention was basal invagination there is no consensus of treatment natural history is not clear best surgical approach remains debatable till dr goel my friend has described the posterior eclant to actual joint distraction and fixation of the c1 c2 joints and then subsequently sarat chandra his you uh, know facetal realignment is a rosetta stone you know you are realign the facet that is the treatment of basal invagination so there are you know the facets can be in various position i think type 1 type 2 type 3 can be treated by by the posterior distraction or anterior distraction for the very gross severe one still transoral odontoid excision remains an option where many people may not agree with me so new thing is distraction compression which was put forth by dr sarat chandra and this type of odontoid fracture still is a candidate for transoral odontoid excision because the joint is vertical whatever distraction you put the joint is going to distract in the same direction it is not going to distract in it unless and until one remodels the joints like dr pravin shankar described but i don't think that is easier said than done and uh, i don't think that uh, that operation is still easy it is still evolving but then the posterior surgery is you know has brought with a lot of complications a lot of problems with the vertebral artery the c2 root the vertebral venous flexors etc etc the anterior surgery is much simple does not require anything more than dividing the just a few attachment of the longus coli unlike posterior surgery where the entire tension band has to be disrupted and the technique is simple just go and expose the joints and put cage cages inside and fix the big bone available of the lateral mass of c1 and the body of c2 to get the distraction this is like an anterior cervical fixation and no need of injuring the c2 root these are examples you see this and you can see this and you can see this these are the cages which are made for me by jeon company from chennai the special smaller sized cages which are wedge shaped and then when you put this is a long term result where you will can see the bone graft bone fusing now the most important part is to know fashion the opposing surfaces and cause bleeding from them you have to take the drill and make holes in the lateral mass and into the superior facet only then the bone will grow across the joint otherwise just pushing inside some cage and relying on nature to cause fusion i think is bad orthopedics so this is an another example you can see this and see how the odontoid has come down and this is a cages with bone graft and another example this flexion extension long term result that it has remained in position so now there are many lines we describe basal invagination the most important one is the grab hooks index that is from the c2 to the posterior end of c2 and the clivus and this distance this distance decides how much is the cervical medullary strain so you can see this example grab box realignment see this and see this post op it should be it is reduced to 4.4 mm it should be less than 9 mm they say now you see this the distraction and repositioning of the odontoid is important getting the cage inside the joint which is wedge shaped this is the principle of physics it will the wedge shaped cage will push the atlas upwards and backwards So this is how the cage works. You put a wedge. You can't put wedge-shaped cages from behind because there's very little space to push the cages. So you push this wedge-shaped case from the front. The wedge works as a simple machine, 
And of course, this got published first in 2016 in again neurological research. Anterior facetal realignment, distraction for atlantoaxial subluxation with basilar invagation, a technical note. Then subsequently, in Neurospine, I had published my work in uh, 2019, and the video also is there, and demystifying basilar invagination, anterior retropharyngeal cage distraction, the wedge technique. And this has got published again in JNS video last year in the June uh, 2020 issue. For those who are interested, it is there in British Journal of Neurosurgery. These are examples of the wedge cage, you know, how you can put the wedge cage and bring the odontoid down and realign the odontoid. And I've gone, you know, look at this case, you know, the very gross, severe basilar invagination, you distract it, and I've gone up to 9 mm, 9 mm. You can put a big cage and push it back. Now, this is a new concept that is coming up. They're making, I've done a few cases, a spacer, which has got one screw, which goes into this lateral mass of C1, and one goes into the body of C2, and there's a locker locking mechanism. But of course, this is still primitive. I've not done many cases of this type. But uh, I will tell you that it is very important to expose from the front because the odontoid gives you per gives you opportunity to re to um, uh, to realign the odontoid process. You can hold the odontoid and bring it back in okay. position, and once it is back in the position, then you can fix the atlantoaxial joint. So now this is an example of a new solution which uh, is already under publication uh, review for publication. This is a basilar invagination with an abnormal vertebral artery from behind, and you can see that this this facet joint you know, is overhanging. So too many complexities. So I went from the front. Now look at this joint. I think the essence of treatment of basilar invagination and deformity is to get the joint back into position. You can appreciate the joint here. And you can appreciate the joint now. Reducing the joint, getting it back into position, that is the treatment of atlantoaxial dislocation and basilar invagination. Simple. So this is the new implant which I put, you know, and I use a bicortical screw. And you can see this grab oaks line. You can see the bone graft in the joint. And you can see this uh, position, repositioning of the atlas over the axis. And this is the new implant, I call it the Parker's plate, you know, which is made out of titanium. And one screw goes into the lateral mass on each side, and there is a screw which goes to the bicortical into the body. These are four mm screws, rich big screws, which go into the body of the C2. And this is a long-term six-month follow-up flexion extension. You can see the reduced atlantoaxial joint with the Parker's plate. Pre-op, and this is post-op. You can see how it is, um, it, it is effective and rigid in holding the atlas over the axis and reducing the atlantic axial dislocation. So these videos can be seen for, by those who are interested. I think this is going to go out of the window. This is not a good operation, you know, disrupting the entire muscle complex, dis detaching the muscles from the occiput. It is, you, know, you detach the biceps and then you say that my, my flexion has become weak and I put a plate across the joint, this is all useless and wrong physics. So this is an example how you can do it. If the problem is anterior, the solution has to be anterior. This kind of operation, disrupting all the muscle, disrupting the attachment to the occipital bone, putting screws in, when the weight transmission is in the front, I think this is not in the principles of proper spinal surgery or orthopedics. So this again, I, I'll show the videos later if we have time. So this is another uh, new concept which I came out with. That, you know, since carrying the skull on the head in you know, a spine is like this, whereas this is the best superior concept where you carry the, the entire globe on your hand. This was a curse to this Atlas because, you know, he had gone against Zeus, his brother. So this was a patient who had undergone atlantoaxial transoral surgery, incomplete surgery with the infected posterior wound, and the entire lateral mass and atlantoaxial joint was infected. The patient was in severe pain, bedridden for almost six months, and they had come to me. This is a new operation which I devised, where I transferred the weight of the skull onto the anterior aspect of the spine. Because there's infection behind, I don't use this area. I transfer the weight of the skull onto the anterior aspect of the spine. So instead of this and this, we do this, where you know the weight is carried on the head. 
So this is another patient who had come with fibrous dysplasia. There's nothing available for fixation over here. So again, I had to transfer the weight of the skull onto the, you can't transfer, these are very weak, they'll break. So this was the new concept of transmitting the weight of the skull onto the bodies of the C2, uh, C3 port, the lower vertebra. And there's a long-term follow -up. Of course, now it is more than two years, and there are many other cases which have done this pre-op, post-op, six months, 12 months, and the bone starts getting remodeled. So this technique is very, very simple. It just does not require too much of uh, manipulation. So this is the case where you expose the cervical spine and you have to understand that lateral to the cervical transverse processes, there is no important structure. So if you go on this side, there's a safe plane lateral to the muscles. So you take these rods and bend them twice, one in this plane and one in this backward plane and push it back through the muscles and fix them anteriorly onto the vertebral body with this new fixator, which has been made by me. And this is again made by Jeon for me. So I fix it on the vertebral bodies. And once that is done, there's a locker in the center. You turn the patient, the rods are coming at the back. Then there are special plates which have been made to you find out which is a dense area on the skull on the CT scan. There's no need to make a midline incision. You just make two vertical incision on the sides and fix that onto the dense area of the skull, which is laterally. And you can pass a rod in that and with the domino connector, connect the rod to this. And then with skull traction, you can reposition it and in the position that you want, you fix the, uh, with the uh, inny nut onto the skull. This is the final construct. And this was the patient who had, you know, a traumatic of this Atlanta actual dislocation with a pathological fracture and severe cord compression. There was no bone available for fixation. And then this operation was done. And <laughs> after about two, two weeks, she got up for two weeks. She was bed for three months. She was bedridden before after surgery, two weeks, she gets up. She can pass and she's very happy now. So craniovertebral fixation, new technique, again showed in American Association of Neurological Surgeons and then published uh, also uh, in neurological research, craniovertebral fixation, a new technique of craniovertebral fixation. So we have to focus, when we talk about it, trying to actually dislocation, we have to ask ourselves, where is the fourth nucleus? Where is the line of weight transmission? What is the quality of bone? And whether this technique is safe and simple and anybody and everybody can do it. There's no point in having a very complex operation and everybody cannot do it or is getting dissuaded from doing it. So our focus must be you know, on making it simpler. This is my friend Atul Goel, who is the pioneer of craniovertebral surgery. And uh, I think that there are many concepts which I have learned from him. This is another new concept which have come out for the rod, you know, because many times you get this rod slippage. So this is the new rod which has been made by me, which I use in almost all kinds of surgery. So the rod gets locked into these uh, systems. So small, small innovations which are important. Never be happy. Always ask, is there a better way? Is there a better way? It is, you know, if happy people are actually dumb people. You should never be happy. So truth will come sooner out of error than from confusion. Dogmatism. Don't be dogmatic that this is the only way to do it because then you cannot come out with something new. Always there, everything has a God, you know, kind of, you know, effect where in the beginning you feel I can do everything. Then you realize that you know, there are a lot of mistakes and then you come to understand the operation and find a solution. So everything goes to the Dunning-Kruger effect. Don't get disillusioned somewhere you're on the curve. You, know? you have to come down and again start rising up and find the mid path, you know. So I always uh, remind people of Joseph Maroon's, you know, presidential address where he says, you know, although the pathological process of spine remain largely unchanged, still, you know, we have to come out with newer technologies which will improve the patient's life. Best versus reasonable, Icarus versus Aquina matters. And I always am grateful to my wife and my anesthetist for the last 35 years who has been my anesthetist. Thank you very much, my dear friends. For